Good evening, I'm Stacey Amos for News Channel 8, and these are the top stories that we have for you tonight. The Department of Education fires 44 employees, and at least 14 are teachers. We've got the exclusive interviews regarding the situation. Judge Willock says LEAC is not illegal, so now what? And the Dominican Republic is about to conduct a first in medicine. Those stories and more up next for you on News Channel 8. <laughs> tonight, 44 Department of Education employees were fired overnight. The Department of Education released this statement today about the situation. With back-to-back -back budget cuts continuing to challenge operations over the past three fiscal years, the Department of Education has been forced to look for short and long-term solutions for cutting millions of dollars in expenses. In the short term, it is necessary for us to continue reducing our personnel budget, which uses up to approximately 85% of our local dollars and is realistically the largest personnel budget in government. It is difficult for us to say that over the next week, the department plans to dismiss 44 more employees, 14 of which are teachers. It is important to note that none of the individuals being dismissed in this wave have the certification or degrees required by law. And while we do assure the public that there should be little to no impact on core instructional programs, after school or summer programs, we do understand the concerns that go along with making this decision. Meanwhile, the response to this has been swift. News Channel 8's Wes Small files this exclusive report with outgoing American Federation of Teachers President James Howell. Thank you very much, Stacy. Very depressing news overnight as uh, the territory finds out that 44 uh, teaching personnel, uh, 14 teachers at least, and the rest personnel have been sent home. Here with American Federation of Teachers President James Howe, perhaps one of the last times that you'll hear from him in his presidential reign as he's been taken over by Ms. Soto Thomas. Um, and Mr. Howe, the numbers are staggering. Uh, 25 in February, 44 last night, and now you're going to tell us some devastating news about school the possibility of it not being opened in the fall for you teachers about an executive committee meeting, and also the fact that you did not know these firings were going to take place last night. Well, as usual, the department, uh, within their contractual uh, arrangement, uh, can dismiss individuals who are not certified, and they don't have to inform us beforehand. All they have to do is inform us after the fact. And I think that they will inform us today of the, and give us a list of all the individuals who would be uh, dismissed. Um, but what is more significant is that uh, the department is going, is reducing the staffing levels in schools, one. And it seems from the press release that the department is going on a procedure where they are eliminating services for children. Uh, if you read the, uh, the commissioner's press release very carefully, she is saying that core subjects will not be touched. That means, as I perceive, that she would be touching gym and PE, health, arts and music. All of these, in, uh, all of these are not in core subject areas. So it seemed to me that the department is on a process of reducing the level and quality and quantity of, of, of instruction that would be going on in school. Uh, and that is it. Uh, but the executive made decisions before the uh, the government or the territories commissioner made decisions. We made a decision not to, uh, an executive committee, not to extend the contract beyond July, uh, the end of July. I want to stop you there because people really don't know what executive committee means. It means a group of you body teachers are now on a month by month contract. Is that right? Yes, it means that. And it means that, that the end of uh, July 31, the executive committee gave me the president and told me not to extend the uh, the contract beyond July 31, which in essence means that the union is positioning itself uh, that at the beginning of school year, that either they have a permanent contract or that they will not be. Uh, 
Say it. <laughs> there will not be be be. be uh... I know it's hard. Say it. <laughs> say it. There won't be school. Well, I can't say there wouldn't be school, uh, but in an executive in an executive session, when individuals make motions, they will follow through with actions. <laughs> In other words, strike is possible for the beginning of school and the teachers won't show up for the first day. Well, if, if they don't have a contract, then there's no guarantee that they will show up. As we conclude this, what are you telling your fellow teachers to do? This is just in its beginning stages. Are you going to have some meetings and so forth? Are you going to work with the new president that's coming in and you all try to get your strategies in order? And, and are the children still the, the foremost? Yes, and that is why the executive committee and the representative council made this motion uh, at the end of the school year because we want everything to be uh, ready for the beginning of the school year. Uh, teachers, uh, paraprofessionals, support staff don't want that at the beginning of the new year that individuals don't know. So we've allowed everyone to be informed that at the end of July, uh, the executive committee made the decision that uh, how we're supposed to move forward. All right, last words, and these could be some of the last words we ever hear from you as, as the president of ATF and St. Croix Federation. My last words, I need to thank all the individuals who supported me. Also, I would advise all the members to save as much money during the summer and prepare as if they were preparing for a hurricane. At the American Federation of Teachers in Bill Lorraine with James Howell, I'm Wes Small for News Channel 8. Also, Senator Alicia Chucky Hansen let her feelings be known on this dismissal. Stacy, we just talked to American Federation of Teachers President James Howell about 44 teachers losing their job just a few hours ago overnight. First senator to respond uh, to News Channel 8 is Senator Alicia Chucky Hansen. Senator, alarming news overnight, 44 uh, teaching personnel, 14 teachers and, and personnel sent home. What do you have to say about that? Well, it is never a happy and pleasant moment to hear that anyone in our government or the private sector will lose their jobs in masses. Uh, but when it comes to teachers, that's a very dangerous area to cut. Very extremely, it's like nurses, doctors, we, and police officers. Teachers are the foundation. They hold on to those young people. And they do everything they can to curve them in the right direction. Education is a key. And when you hear that our young people begin to lose teachers, then we have a serious, very serious problem. Because, like I said, where are these young people are going to go? There are many areas. I, I, I have a list of areas that the commissioner has spent money on to include going on trips, you know, uh, what they call retreats, that cost this government thousands of dollars. And so it gives the question whether or not those, you know, layoffs are necessary. I mean, they cannot be. Uh, we are also losing federal funding that we should never be losing. Uh, it, it's really getting mad. So I'm hoping that this week, with a meeting with the governor, we can reanalyze the situation and we have some reconsideration. Thank you. I know your staff is just getting into that one. Well, she fought the junior ROTC decision. She won. She fought the LEAC, and so far, uh, not good, but over? she's it's not over <laughs> and just um, pretty bad news about the 44 teachers and she's going to try to help that situation too. Like I say, I don't know how you sleep. Mm -hmm. Senator Lisa Chucky Hansen at the legislature in Fredericksted. I'm Wes Small for News Channel 8. And a very special announcement from the Sanker Educational Complex about the final deadline for summer school registration. Final registration for Sanker Educational Complex High Summer School will be held on Wednesday, June 20th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the school's library. Only $20 will be collected for insurance. Classes will be held 8.15 a.m. to 12 noon, Monday to Fridays, from June 22nd to July 27th. Now the health department will observe National HIV Testing Day beginning Friday, June 22nd, in partnership with Scotiabank and Caricom. The Department of Health STD HIV TB program will host a series of activities beginning Friday, June 22nd, as part of activities in commemoration of National and Regional HIV Testing Day activities. 
National HIV Testing Day is observed annually on June 27th, and regional testing observed by CARICOM, or the Caribbean Community Islands, is celebrated on June 29th. The theme for National HIV Testing Day is Take the Test, Take Control. And staff from the STD HIV TB program will work with the local businesses and communities, including area nightclubs and housing communities, to provide free screening services. Coming up... Find out when the Dominican Republic's first heart transplant is being planned and celebrate with Puerto Rico on a recent achievement in advertising. That's next in your Caribbean Report. This is News Channel 8. This is News Channel 8. Now here's your Caribbean Report. From the Caribbean region, the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development, entitled Rio Plus 20, is taking place in Brazil from June 20th through the 22nd. At the conference, leaders from the Caribbean and all across the world, along with thousands of participants from governments and other groups, will come together to shape how we can reduce poverty, advance social equity, and ensure environmental protection on an ever more crowded planet to get to the future that we want. Expectations for the conference are quite high. From Antigua, Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Health, Social Transformation, Consumer Affairs, and Local Government Senator Malaka Parker and Senate Minority Leader Senator Gail Christian were among nine female members of Parliament from the Caribbean who met in Washington, D.C. as part of a new global network of women leaders. From the BVI, the BVI National Culinary Team leaves the BVI today to take part in the annual Taste of the Caribbean competition at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Miami. Their aim is to once again recapture the gold for the BVI as they did in 2011. From Cuba, Cuba is the major biodiversity center in the Caribbean, marked by high natural values, varied ecosystems, and high endemic levels. It's for these reasons the Cuban archipelago is a significant representative of regional and world heritage. From the Dominican Republic, the country's first heart transplant is being planned for next week in the Cardio Neuro Ophthalmology and Transplant Center, which will establish the National Heart Transplant Program in the country. From Guyana, Guyana's president President Daniel Ramatar met with the governor of Brazil, Jose de Anchieta, to discuss strengthening bilateral ties between the two countries prior to the Rio Plus 20 conference. From Jamaica, Jamaica at number 16 topped the eight CARICOM countries included in a survey on their ability to foster low carbon energy growth. CARICOM countries as a whole received low grades of all the 26 countries that were examined in the survey. From Montserrat, opposition leader Donaldson Romeo has filed a motion of no confidence in the government of Premier Ruben Mead, accusing him of engaging in several recent decisions that may have negative implications for the political and economic future of the country. From Puerto Rico, J. Walter Thompson, Puerto Rico, has been awarded the prestigious Grand Prix Lion for Public Relations at this year's Cannes Lions International Festival of Creativity, the world's premier showcase for excellence in advertising. The honor recognizes JWT Puerto Rico for Banco Popular's most popular song campaign and marks the first ever Grand Prix Award for Puerto Rico. From St. Lucia, the ongoing verbal tussle between St. Lucia's former leader Stevenson King and his successor, Dr. Kenny Anthony, took another turn on Monday as King accused Anthony of intimidation in announcing a probe into the previous government for misconduct. From St. Kitts and Nevis, a number of tax concessions on alternative energy equipment has just been approved by the cabinet to issue a waiver of import duty and customer service charges on a list of energy efficient products. And also from St. Kitts and Nevis, the IMF has painted a gloomier forecast for the economy Economy, saying there will be no growth this year, but it did praise the country for meeting all of its fiscal targets as it continues to dig out from under one of the world's highest mountains of debt. And in your cricket update, England gave themselves an excellent chance of wrapping up the one-day series by restricting West Indies to 238 for nine at the Oval, although the visitors kept themselves in the game after Dwayne Bravo and Keon Pollard combined for a 100-run fifth-wicket stand. Chris Gale earlier marked his return to international cricket with a rapid half-century, which included a period of five sixes and 11 deliveries before England hit back with four wickets for 16. But the match is being played against a somber backdrop following the death on Monday of Surrey Baspin Tom Maynard, and there was a minute's silence before play started while both teams wore black armbands. And July 11th, which is the date for the first one-day international cricket match between the West Indies and New Zealand at the Warner Park Cricket Stadium, has been declared a holiday in St. Kitts and Nevis. Three one-day matches will be played in the Federation between July 11th and the 16th. Please be sure to check our Facebook page for all full details on stories in the Caribbean Report. 
Now, in other news, now that Judge Harold Willocks has ruled that the LEAC rule is legal, where does the community stand? News Channel 8's Wes Small is with Senator Alicia Chucky Hansen. Senator Alicia Chucky Hansen, and I don't want to say you're licking your wounds, but I don't think anyone is really happy about the decision of Judge Willocks to say that the LEAC is not illegal. It was interesting when we listened to remarks from the PSC, it was almost like they were celebrating, and I was like, wow. And then Hugo Hodge, executive director for WAPA, he put it down a little more. He said, this is no reason to celebrate. Um, I, I, I don't hope, think I anyone that, wants the Leah. I hope that senators who are also celebrating understand this is not a reason to celebrate. Our people are hurting. And uh, you're probably on the right direction in thinking that no one will be happy about uh, the decision. But there are people that are happy. There are people that are gloating over it. And unfortunately, those that are gloating are representatives of the people because they think that it will hurt me, I heard the whole community is affected by the LEAC. And of course, some more than others. For senators, not as bad as other people that have to struggle. We are struggling, but there are some that struggle more because they just don't have it. They are paying more in LEAC than they pay for mortgages and that we're paying for rents. Okay, a lot of people can't even get their children to and from colleges on the mainland. And that's because all about the LIAC. Stores, businesses are closing at the rate at five to seven per month. Wow. This is a crisis. It is worse than a hurricane, five hurricane category. And I'm saying that the judge made his decision. It was only a two page opinion which really surprised me. This case has been going on since August of last year, 2011, okay? I did as I promised. There is no way under this world that anyone can convince me that something is not wrong where you're gonna have a LIAC of five times more than your consumption. The issue of the third extension agreement was not even addressed in the opinion. So I guess that question will just remain in limbo on whether or not the third extension agreement was in compliance as it was charging relative to WAPA versus the Public Service Commission looking at all of how they calculate those numbers before the victory is prior to taking this case to court. WAPA couldn't even look at the books. Hmm. They didn't even look at the books. They, they said on the record that uh, has continued to block them, to refuse them from looking at their books. Shortly after I filed, now this has gone on for years. Shortly after I filed the case number SX11CV364. You know what happened shortly after that? They invite them to look at the books. And we've been charged four, five times more, and we can't look at your books, and you're under an extension agreement with the government of the Virgin Islands, but guess how they look at the books? No analysis, none. And the Public Service Commission clearly responded to my question to the consultants when I asked them at those hearings, how you have come up to the numbers and allow WAPA to charge the consumer those amount. Have you ever made an analysis on the third extension agreement? These are the consultants for the Public Service Commission who are proven these uh, increases every time you blink your eyes prior to my coming into this term. And you know what the response was? They never, ever, ever, in fact, analyzed those extension agreements. So how the hell we know whether or not we're being charged correctly? Senator. Your legal counsel is, is, is uh, watching this interview as we speak. Um, will we have an appeal on Judge Willock's uh, decision? We are closely looking at it. We, are, we don't have much to analyze. What we are analyzing is the things that were not addressed. Right. 
you know, which I, it was a major surprise and a disappointment to me and many people in our community because we really want to know if this government was charged correctly based on the third extension agreement. Don't just tell us. We want the analysis. We want to see it. We want to know if it's correct. We want it done by experts and get a final level of comfort. Nowhere else in this world do we, uh, we have under American flag that we have this high rate uh, the charge per kilowatt, okay? And on top of that, they liak five times more. It's really a criminal act on the people of the Virgin Islands. All right, that's one, and that is about the liak and Judge Willick's decision uh, recently that he did not deem it illegal, and we will have to still pay the liak. I'm Wes Small for News Channel 8. Coming up, Central Basketball Championship is in your Sports 411. This newscast has been sponsored by Mario's Virgin Crystal. Let us save you the hassle of lugging those jugs around. Purified bottled water conveniently delivered to your home or office. Also available in your favorite grocery store. Call 773-2810. This is News Channel 8. This is News Channel 8. Now here's Stephen Koo Francis with your Sports 411. Thanks a lot, Stacey. The yes, very men basketball team lost to Mexico in its opening game at the Central Basketball Championship 75 to 67 in San Juan on Monday. Walter Hodge led the way for the Virgin Islands with 18 points, 7 rebounds, and 7 assists. Teammate Jason Edwin had a double-double with 14 points and 11 rebounds. The USVI shot a double 54% from the free throw line, 23 to 42. They will have to do much better than that if they plan to win like how they won in the Bahamas last July in the Caribbean Basketball Confederation Championship, where the USVI was a perfect 5-0. The USVI, however, did win the battle of the fast break against Mexico 22 to 12. That's something they can hang on their hat as they move forward. Next up for the USVI is Jamaica, which took place today at 1 p.m. The final score, Jamaica 80, USVI 64. Walter Hodge led the way with 20 points. The USVI falls to 0-2. They will face Costa Rica on Wednesday. That's a look at Sports 401 update. I'm Stephen Francis from News Channel 8. Back to you, Stacey.